Welcome. Welcome everybody to People Dancing. My name is Sarah Houston and I'm the chair of the Foundation for Community Dance. It is my great pleasure and honor to open this very exciting event and what a, an event it promises to be. 22 countries are represented among over 300 delegates, making it a truly international event and the highlight of UK Dance Calendar 2014. People Dancing has had a long gestation. It began several years ago with a group of board members sitting in the Royal Festival Hall in London with Ken Bartlett, who was the creative director at the time. Ken, myself and others were traveling around the world making connections with dance practitioners working in diverse community settings. We wanted to capitalize on the knowledge and understanding that was started to be fostered between people. We wanted an international event that enabled this to happen. We wanted to develop intercultural dialogue as a way of allowing the community and participatory dance profession to broaden horizons and ideas. We wanted an event where we could share practices and visions. We wanted to learn from others. We wished for an event to celebrate the wealth of community dance at the same time as asking people to question, to analyze, to take nothing for granted. We wanted an event from which might spring an international network of practitioners. From these grand beginnings and under the inspired curation of our associate director, Kate Castle, there has developed a whole three-day jam-packed program which we hope remains true to these original ideals. As chair, I have been privileged to be part of an organization that has taken its remit seriously, being instrumental in developing the confidence, standards, and visibility of community dance in England and more widely. It has been tremendously exciting to watch community and participatory dance develop in quality, in output, and in stature. With now around 2,400 members and a reach of over 68,000 people, the Foundation for Community Dance is now one of the major strategic support organizations in the arts and a leader within the field in dance. I'm extremely proud of the fact that this has led to the recognition from organizations in other walks of life who have realized the power of people dancing and have wanted to connect with us. Only two weeks ago, for example, I attended the launch of an important report written by Public Health England on encouraging people to exercise daily Thanks to conversations with the Foundation for Community Dance, People Dancing is now a central plank of this initiative and was marked by a Bollywood class at the Oval Cricket Ground. Dancing happens everywhere, even on a cricket pitch. Over the next three days at this wonderful venue, you will be able to experience dancing and listen to stories and ideas connected to people dancing in all sorts of situations and contexts. You will be able to find out about leadership and teaching practice for people dancing at a particular age or in specific circumstances. You will be treated to a new creative thoughts and performances that will allow you to see what can be done irrespective of age and circumstance you might be provoked and challenged. You might be inspired. Over the last year, people dancing has been gathering momentum, no mean feat given the size of the task. Our partners in Wales have been fantastically supportive, as have other organizations that have helped fund this initiative. 
This support has allowed us to create an exciting, internationally creative event. The staff at the Foundation for Community Dance have been working very hard, but with tremendous motivation to get the show up and running. And I would like to thank them personally and publicly for the monumental effort that they've put into realizing this event. Most of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I do urge you to take advantage of your time here to experience, network, think, pause, reflect, and enjoy. It is my pleasure now to hand over to our keynote speaker this morning. He has, for over 35 years, influenced and challenged cultural policy. He has particularly highlighted issues concerning economic and social regeneration, both in the United Kingdom and notably in South Africa. As Director of Northern Arts and Special Projects Advisor to Gateshead Council in the 1990s, he played a major role in creating and developing the cultural regeneration of Tyneside in the northeast of England. He has held a professorship at Northumbria University, establishing the Center of Applied Research there. He also created the first cultural management master's degree in Africa and has lectured at City University in London. Receiving an OBE in the 1990, he now chair, is chair of Voluntary Arts. Our speaker acts as a consultant on public policy, strategies, and funding programs in arts and culture. His recent major reports, Rebalancing Our Culture's Capital and Policy for the Arts and Community in England on Arts Funding have moved inspired, challenged, and provoked reaction. And we expect the same today. Delegates, I would like you to give a very warm welcome to Peter Stark. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome and uh, what a pleasure it is to be here. As Sarah said, I've been asked to reflect and uh, provoke and perhaps uh, inform a little bit out of a career which is getting dangerously close to 50 rather than 35 years now. Uh, in fact, uh, it is a little known part of my career that there is a sense in which it begins 50 years ago as secretary of the Newcastle Royal Grammar School's Scottish Country Dancing Association, a role which I held uh, and which had nothing to do at all with the fact that it was the only licensed uh, society in the school, which was an all-male affair, that was allowed to have co-membership with the Central High School girls on the other side of the road. Um, being a cultural manager rather than artist has its advantages but my shotish is still talked about with affection and reverence. Um, uh, not that I practice it as much as, or as often as I used to. Okay. Um, I'm coming to you, I'm coming to talk to you today from three countries. Uh, from England, that riven, uncertain, large extension of its own capital, revolutionary forces massing to the north and the southwest, which it is becoming again, to my delight. Um, and I need to apologize to colleagues here from Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland and Ireland and elsewhere in the world, that a fair bit of what I will be saying in the latter part of my remarks will relate specifically to the English situation. Um, I hope you find what we are going through in England uh, as reflecting on the benefits which you enjoy uh, from not being part of that benighted <laughs> country. Uh, secondly, I come to you from having spent 12 years living and working and becoming uh, a, a citizen in, 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 in South Africa, 
But thirdly, and the one that I want to talk about first, I come to you from the past. I come to you, to you from that other country uh, where things are done differently. And as I've got older, I've learned to reflect more and more on the importance of understanding where we come from if we're to have guidance in charting our way forward. So just a little bit of reflection of the bits of history that I didn't know I was part of before I tripped over them later in life with the suggestion that you might look back into the history of dance in your countries and the leaders who have made what you are becoming possible. Um, as a fat 15-year-old boy, I, with spots, I, uh, I, I fell into a youth theater at the bottom of my road in Newcastle uh, called the People's Theater Youth Theater, 1961. And I, by the time I was 16, I'd read Stanislavski's An Actor Prepares. Um, uh, we were doing Grotowski exercises, and, I, uh, and we were performing Brecht and debating the subjects that he was raising. And I honestly believed that everybody had that opportunity at the bottom of their road. And it was only when I went to university in the Midlands, I went to Leeds from Newcastle, um, that was the Midlands, um, that I realized that that wasn't the case. And in a sense, the driver, the primary driver of my entire career has been to try and make that which I had the privilege to enjoy as a young, as a young person available to many, many more people. But it was only later that I learned that the People's Theatre had been founded in 1911 as the Clarion Players to raise funds for the British Socialist Party. It was only later that I realized that the three teachers that were teaching me had been members of Joan Littlewood's theater workshop. Uh, in 1968, as a, doing my Henry Wilt years at Erdington Technical College in Birmingham, um, I was part of the group Average Age 19 that set up the Birmingham Arts Laboratory. And we were given space in the Birmingham settlement. I, thought, I didn't know anything about the settlement movement. The settlement movement in South Wales and in the northeast of England were the first recipients of public funding for the arts in, this, in the UK in the 1930s. It was part of a program to help get unemployed miners particularly uh, engaged in constructive creative activity. Participatory arts is to an extent rooted then in part in the settlement movement. I didn't know that. And then... Uh, when I was at Northern Arts, and we were trying to craft a different kind of regional arts board, and I was looking at the example of the Sports Council and how it had infiltrated local government, I went to see the retiring Northern director of the Sports Council. I said, talk to me about how you work. What is it that's at the, the essence? What, what's, what informs you? And he said, well, he said, I'll, I'll tell you a story. When I was a young man, I'd just been demobbed after the war. And there was a group of us, and we were running around the country organizing this, organizing that. And the then director of the Central Council for Physical Recreation called us into our office, lined us up, and said, gentlemen, there are two lessons which we will put into practice from now on if we are going to make opportunities for physical recreation available to everybody in this country, they are, one, we never achieve anything. Two, no local authority ever makes a mistake. And if you think about, those of you who are a, a bit more ancient like me, you think of the trajectory of the way in which the Sports Council infiltrated local government throughout this country with SASH 1 and SASH 2 sports halls, codes of practice, schemes to assist, coaching, all of those things, that tradition of support at regional and national level for participation in sport and physical recreation, that success is built still upon those two premises. And we tried to apply that in setting up the Local Arts Development Agency Network in the Northeast. So look to the past the things that can help you think about what's a very, very different future, but there are still lessons uh, to be learned. Um, 
South Africa. Um, go there if you ever get a chance. It's one overnight flight away. Look, compare the cost of going there. It's the most extraordinary country. But it's also a place where I learned uh, after a successful career here that I needed to start again in my thinking about what it was that culture could contribute uh, in society uh, and within the economy. Um, and I was useful because I brought certainty about some of those things into a country that had been isolated behind what they call the Bourdavos curtain, the farmer's sausage curtain, um, throughout the apartheid, apartheid years. The opportunities for learning from international practice were, were very small. Um, and so, with growing confidence and a growing certainty that there was something that existed at a level of cultural truth between, uh, in connection between the values of Ubuntu, the social definition of self, I am because we are, and the traditions of community solidarity that informed 300 years of working class aristocracy male in the northeast of England through the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that growing certainty led me to establish uh, uh, the Swallows Partnership, um, between the northeast of England and the East, Eastern Cape. And I was sitting at dinner with the formidable um, head of sport, recreation, arts, and culture in the Eastern Cape, pitching like mad for her to agree to formally forge this this partnership, when she stopped me and she said, Peter, that's fine, that's very well and good, and we will go ahead with this partnership, but I have to tell you that until such time as our Premier signs formally the Memorandum of Understanding, we reserve the right absolutely to walk away, because after all, Peter, we have very little reason to trust the British. And it was like I'd been punched in the stomach. I, I, I spluttered. I don't splutter very often, and it was unfortunate what I was eating at the time, but don't mind. And, and, I, and I had to take it away, and I had to think very hard about what I'd just been told, because what I'd just been told is what I'd assumed, which was, you know, our recent history of general, apart from Maggie's support for the anti-apartheid movement, the boycott, everything else, we'd been the good guys. And you know, the frontier wars were a long time in the past. No, they weren't. Uh, what we called the frontier wars were for the Amakosa, uh, the Hundred Years' Wars of Dispossession. Nine, but nine wars fought against the British over a period of nearly a hundred years, uh, whilst we systematically lied, cheated, built, slaughtered our way to taking the land that had previously been theirs. And it was still alive, and I hadn't spotted it. And I should have done, because I'd worked in Ireland. You know, I, I should have spotted the way in which history is still alive in the cultures. And our global history as British, the impact we have had in the world, is something which, if we are to be international, if you are to be international in the future, you need to be aware of the impact, good and bad, evil and good that we as a nation and as an empire had because those memories are still alive. And until we understand the way we are seen elsewhere, we will not understand the new Britons who come and live here. We will not understand them. And that involves us in traveling. It involves us in biting the environmental bullet, finding ways to do it sensibly. It involves us going to another country and looking, and listening, and learning. And I commend all of you, whilst you're young enough and fresh enough, to get out there into the world and do that. Thirdly, uh, I came back to England. And I carried with me the lessons that I'd just given to you. I was coming back to another country. It was achingly familiar. I knew the northeast of England pretty much inside and out. And yet I didn't know it because there was a 12-year lacuna when I'd been elsewhere. And so I schooled myself not to jump to conclusions, to be aware of heffalump traps that might be waiting for the unwary cultural policy person as they strolled through the forest. 
And gradually, I began to feel that something was, was wrong. It was a, there was an unease, an uncertainty. I was disquieted. And the first part of learning what that was, was to begin to travel more in London and the Southeast and to realize that that was, that had become, that was becoming a different country within the UK and within England. That the global city was, in a sense, lifting off and away from the rest of our country. And that expressed itself in a number of ways, but obviously the way that I was thinking about mostly was, was the arts and culture, and that took me to the work looking at the numbers and the differentiation there. But also, I came home to a profession. I came home to arts management. I came home to what I'd done all my working life. And there were things here that I wasn't comfortable with either. Um, and I thought, well, it's, I'm becoming a grumpy old man. You know, <laughs> I am one. <laughs> And, and my colleague David Powell said, well, you know, we're becoming nothing but a collection of old anecdotes. And, 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 and so we really did quiz ourselves and say, is, is that, or is there something here that we really ought to be unhappy about? And there were things that we joked about. There's a, I've forgotten his name, but he just died. But he, he wrote something about going to see your bank manager. We used to go and see bank managers. We don't go and see bank managers anymore we go and see relationship managers, and that ought to tell us something, because Relate is the NGO you go to when your personal relationship is breaking down. And I understand there are other organizations that use the term relationship manager, but I can't think who they might be for the moment. And, 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 then, and then I began to reflect on, on my profession. And when I started working with trusts, like the Leeds Playhouse Trust, that was on very young the person who ran it was called the secretary for the trust. The Arts Council was a secretary general. We managers knew our place. Roy Shaw, Professor Roy Shaw, secretary general of the Arts Council, took two years to convince the Arts Council that they ought to train some arts administrators. They're allowed to be called arts administrators. And 12 a year was judged to be an appropriate number. Then we became arts managers, and that was all right, and then we became cultural managers, and now suddenly we're all cultural leaders. And that's hubristic, and that's dangerous, and I have to tell you, because I know a little bit about this, that there ain't the space for the number of cultural leaders that we're busy creating, where who leads who it begins to be the interesting question. And and then, when I began to talk to Liz Hill, a quite extraordinary editor of Arts Professional, if you don't subscribe, subscribe. It's online, and it's wonderful. And she began to tell of the way in which, whenever she brought up a story that was critical of the funding body, um, the, the story peaked, and then suddenly went completely quiet. Nobody was prepared to go on social media and talk about or comment about what had just been exposed or talked about or whatever. And my colleagues and I realized that the sector had got fricked. Had, there was fear of the funder abroad. And that that was something that had grown whilst I'd been away. Now, I have a... I have a definition of leadership, which I got from an extraordinary American called Bob Terry, which is the courage to bring forth authentic action in the commons. And if the commons is the public, then a concern with authenticity, a concern with truth, has to be at the center of what we do in the arts, what we create, what we try to make, and it has to be at the center of what we try to understand when we look at heritage. And for us who are centrally concerned with those truths and authenticities, to be part of a structure which is lying is profoundly unhealthy to our work and our future and our uh, spirit, in my judgment. 
and so we decided we ought to do something. And that also was informed by uh, the wonderful observation of Michael Covey, Stephen Covey, on the difference between management and leadership, which is, uh, he says, the manager, the strategic manager is very clear. The work has been done, the whiteboards have been done, the consultation has been done, the research has been done, the staff have been brought together, the objective, the direction is known, is shared. The, lead, the uh, strategic manager is at the front of the team, hacking its way through the forest, running back to keep the body of the kirk together, leading the singing, looking after the stragglers. We are clear, we were where we're going. The leader is up the tallest tree saying, wrong forest. And just occasionally, you can't do that too often. That's a trick you don't get to pull too often. But just occasionally it needs to be done. And we reflected on the fact that wrong forest was both the wrong forest, but it was also the wrong forest. It was the forest that was called wrong. And in England, we began to talk more clearly about what some of those wrong things might be. Um, we argued it is wrong that taxpayers' money uh, is spent 14 to 1 per capita in London as opposed to the rest of the country. Uh, it is wrong that we have a, 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 a cultural ministry and an arts council that for 30 to 40 years has said, we'd love to do more in the regions. We really would. If only we had a bit of new money, clear new money, then our first priority, we will be committed to doing more in the regions. 3.5 billion pounds later of money for new and additional activity, that ratio is still four to one per capita in favor of London. That's wrong. 50% of England, just England, higher proportion of the UK, lives more than a comfortable daytime commute from London. Have you tried to stay in a budget hotel in London recently, any of you? Know how much it costs? No? What's the premium for the use of our capital cities that anybody who lives more than uh, a comfortable daytime commute from London has to pay to take advantage of what we all pay for with our taxpayers' residence? Shouldn't that form part of thinking about national cultural policy? And then we come, we come more, what was that a two minute for? Right, okay, that's gonna be fun, okay. Um, and there are many more examples such as that. Um, not least, not least uh, in the different ethical base that needs to inform lottery funding. Uh, lottery funding, as Anthony Sargent says about the SAGE, he never forgets that the SAGE as a building and the SAGE as an operation is substantially funded by some of the poorest in society who pay a higher proportion of their income in uh, choosing to play the lottery than others do. And in our latest report, Hard Facts to Swallow, uh, you'll find more of our concerns about the way in which a lack of transparency uh, in the operation of the structure of uh, the, the, the Arts Council has caused uh, further uh, structural disjunction between what we are told is happening and what is actually happening. So. Uh, where do we end up? We end up with the holistic case for capital, which is now on the Arts Council's website, saying what the Arts Council does, what the Arts Council, sorry, saying what the Arts Council's case to the public is for funding. And we end up with a chairman of the Arts Council who can write as follows. We do not cherish the arts because of their impact on our social well-being or cohesion our physical and mental health, our education system, our national status, or economy. Instead, we cherish them because of their intrinsic value, how they illuminate our inner lives and enrich our emotional world. Where did that instead come from? What's your experience? I sit and listen to Beethoven quartets. I sit and listen to Billie Holiday. I look at extraordinary paintings. My inner world is illumined. My spiritual life is enriched. Does that mean that I don't go out and try to make a difference in the world? 
Does that mean that I don't value the impacts that we can have in society, in education, in working with people who carry a disability and working with the elderly? Does that mean that these two things are different? Does that mean these things are either or? They're both and, they're intrinsic to our practice, our beliefs and every part of us. And we have an Arts Council chair which is capable of making that false juxtaposition. It's a cheap debating trick and it does not belong in discourse about cultural policy in our countries. So where are we now? I think we're at a very key tipping point where, where the select committee report that's just been published uh, on the work of Arts Council England uh, gives us an opportunity to change the game. We have an opportunity to go and look at that website on the Arts Council and look at all of the values that they say the arts deliver. They say in, cult in society, to culture, in the economy, in education, and say that's the kind of Arts Council we want, that's the kind of cultural policy we want, and go out there and make it happen. So I want, I hope, that in discussions around your conference, you're not only going to learn from each other, you're not going to only to learn from other countries, but you're also going to be prepared to get a bit cross and to decide to do something and to change the way in which the arts in England are funded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, yes, you did deliver a um, inspired and provocative talk. I would now like to um, uh, introduce uh, Ken Skates, Deputy Minister for Culture, Sport and Tourism at the Welsh Assembly. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Diolch uh, and good afternoon, welcome to Wales. It's fantastic to be with you today. Um, and it's an honor to speak, not least to speak after what was an inspiring um, speech by Peter. And I think, I was, I was number crunching yesterday actually with regard to the arts and it appears that the level of cuts in England are as much as three times that which we've experienced in Wales, because of course the Welsh government is absolutely determined to make sure that the arts are utilized, not just for the purpose of social interaction and for engagement with citizens, but also to improve education attainment. And I'll come to that very important point shortly. I'm very excited to be here today with you in what was recently judged to be the friendliest, most welcoming theater in the whole of the UK. We're very proud of this institution. It's an institution that reaches out to all parts of Wales. And I very much hope that you enjoy your time here. The Welsh Government's program for government places an enormous emphasis on promoting arts and culture and aspires to widen access to cultural activities and to the understanding of the role that the arts plays in our national and international identity. And as Deputy Minister responsible for the arts, my priority is to increase opportunities for all citizens to engage with arts and culture. All communities benefit from access to the arts and participation in the arts can be a way of developing communication, social abilities, strengthening identity, self-advocacy, and empowerment. And I'm delighted that Cardiff was chosen as host city for people dancing. This is quite fitting, I believe, as Wales has an impressive history of the development of participatory dance whilst offering outstanding venues and partnerships. Organizations focusing on community participation in dance in Wales, such as Rubicon Dance and Dancy Baub, have developed excellent programs for a broad range of people. And you'll be aware that there is a great amount of evidence that demonstrates how participation in cultural activity boosts people's life chances. 
That's, of course, why Baroness Andrews' report is so very important, the report entitled Culture and Poverty. It was commissioned by the Welsh Government to explore with cultural and heritage bodies right across Wales how they could contribute more effectively to reducing poverty and raising ambition. And Baroness Andrews, who I understand will be with you tomorrow as a keynote speaker, recognizes in her report the important role that the arts play in society and proposes measures to anchor culture in communities, to tear down barriers to the participation in cultural institutions, and to raise educational standards. Her report also recommends joined up strategies that will lead to cultural organizations working more closely together to address poverty. For example, developing stronger links with anti-poverty schemes such as the Welsh Government's Communities First program. And I share the belief that where barriers to participation in arts exist, be they psychological or financial or geographical, we must all work together to overcome them. I think Peter spoke about perhaps the biggest challenge that many of us face, which is to take on those people and institutions and those mindsets that have allowed spending on the arts to be concentrated in the areas where there is the greatest degree of power. And in this regard, the London Fortress of Arts, as, as good as it may be in promoting the arts within London, to some extent is a prisoner of the arts and should be opened up for the whole of Great Britain. So I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody. You are, without a doubt, very welcome here in Cardiff and in Wales. Wales is very rich in culture and heritage, and as my role as Deputy Minister also includes tourism, I very much hope that you'll have the opportunity to see what makes this city the happiest city in the UK and much of what makes Wales so very special. So I'd like to wish all of you involved in people dancing the very best success, not just for this event, but for many more to come. Dear Alcumvarian. <laughs>